If you're looking for success in the vacation rental industry, Heather Bayer and the team at cottageblogger.com are here to show you that it's entirely within reach. Welcome to Vacation Rental Success, the show that features interviews with industry experts, successful vacation rental owners, and more, all geared toward helping you make it happen. Here's your host, Heather Bayer. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. This is your host, Heather Bayer, and I'm delighted to be back with you again. If you're listening to this on Publication Day, I will be at the Vacation Rental Women's Summit in New Orleans, possibly on stage as you listen, depending on what time it is, of course. I'll be doing two presentations there. I'm doing one on love languages with my dear friends, Tyan Marsink and Jessica Vozell. It's a presentation we did at the VRMA conference in Las Vegas last year, and it went down really, really well. And what we've done is, well, what Tyann did, in fact, was take the concept of Gary Chapman's love languages and adapt them to demonstrate how we can communicate much better with our guests if we are communicating at all their different levels of love language. If you haven't heard about Gary Chapman's Love Languages, I'll put a link to his book at the bottom of the show notes. You can go and take a look. And also a link to a questionnaire that Tyann did after around the time that we did that presentation in Las Vegas. And it allows you to go and see what your love language is as it relates to renting a vacation home. So we took a bit of a leap of faith doing this. It's a lot of fun and I'm going to really enjoy doing that presentation again. I'm also doing one on how to start a podcast. And I think I've mentioned this before. Starting a location-based podcast could be a really great way for you to become an influencer in your area if you really know the area well. And you can interview people about it. You can talk about it. You can talk about the restaurants, the activities that people can do, the attractions that they can go and see, any other places of interest. You have probably got enough content to start an audio based podcast. And you have probably got enough content to start a podcast. And in my presentation, I talk about how to do this, the steps that you need to take. And in fact, it it really is relatively easy. And the thing is with a podcast is that once you have it up and running, once you've got all the technical stuff out of the way, uploading it to iTunes and getting a host and all those things and getting the equipment, after you've done all that, it's really simple. You just open up a channel with somebody you're going to interview, whether it's on Skype or whether it's a face-to-face discussion. You just take along a mobile podcasting kit. You just do your interview and then you edit it and then out it goes. And it really couldn't be easier. So over the next couple of months, I will be creating a short course on how to do this. And hopefully we're going to get a few people who dedicate themselves, commit themselves to getting a podcast off the ground. And a quick shout out here to the Inside Vermont show, which is a non-Vermonters guide. I came across this on Twitter the other day. And when I connected with them and said, this sounds like fun, I heard that they were in the middle of recording their first few shows and will go live soon. And the message to me was they'd taken my advice to start a local podcast. So I am so excited at listening to that one when it comes out. And we will be promoting that as much as we can on Twitter and Facebook and trying to get the message out to anybody that's visiting Vermont to go take a listen to the Inside Vermont for podcast. So that's something else. Anybody that's that's going to do this to go and start a podcast, then let me know because we will promote the socks off it. OK, I am on my own as a little bit of a solo today because I couldn't get my act together before we left Needles, California and headed east to Dallas and interview anybody, mainly because the Wi-Fi in Needles was pretty awful and I was having a real problem with Skype. I was just having a techno challenge, a real techno challenge. And I'd, I'd like to thank 
my friend Erica Muller hugely for putting up with me last week before we uh, published my interview with her because I kept putting it off and putting it off because I couldn't get Skype to work. So thank you, Erica. You are such a star. And of course, Erica's one of the people I'm going to be meeting with at Vacation Rental Women's Summit, as well as numerous other people that I'll be networking with. So, you know, just a plug, as ever, about conferences. They are so worthwhile. They're so worth the money in the networking that you can do. Just talking to people, getting their ideas, learning what's working for them, what resources they're using, what hacks that they've discovered that's making their life easier. And and that's just the networking, you know, not even going there on the educational front. So when you see a conference advertised, a vacation rental conference advertised, really think about going, really think about investing your time in it because it really is well worth the time and the money. That's my plug for the conferences. And of course, if you're out there wondering when the next Vacation Rental Success Summit is going to be, we will be announcing something very, very soon. We're just finalising some details on dates and venues and we will let you know. So as I say, I'm soloing it today. And when I was trying to think of a topic, I was going through some really, really old blog posts on cottageblogger.com. And by the way, cottageblogger.com, it still exists. It's still out there. But we we have moved over to vacationrentalformula.com. So if you go to cottageblogger.com and you see that it hasn't really been updated with the latest podcasts, that's because they are all showing on Vacation Rental Formula. Okay, that's that was that. So topic this week, I found when I was looking through some old blog posts and I came across one of the most popular ones I ever did, which was called 10 Mistakes VRBOs Often Make. And it says, number five will kill your business before it gets started. And I thought, well, this is, I know this is an old blog post. I'll go through it and see if, see if we can update it a little. Because we all want to know what mistakes we might be making and how to put something in place to ensure that they don't impact us in any way. And it was interesting when I read through this. I mean, this was probably about six years ago I wrote the blog post, maybe, maybe seven. I can't, couldn't find a date on it. But I went through, I'm just going very quickly through the 10 points. So the first one was not screening. And this was at a time when I said, you have to talk to guests on the phone and not by email to establish what they're looking for in a vacation rental and and deciding whether your property is right for them. And conversely, whether you want them in your property. And I thought, ah, you know, we can't do that now. We are not, we, we don't screen anymore. Or if we do, it, it's not in the way that we used to do it five years, 10 years ago. I mean, mostly our, our guests are booking online and instantly. And as I update these big mistakes, I'll give you some tips on how to do that screening now so that, you know, that they're sort of self-screening before they book. The second mistake I had was listing with too many sites. And I'm in fact going to talk a little bit, not about listing with too many sites, but about listing with too few sites. Because at that time, we weren't as dominated by the OTAs as we are now. Some of you who've been in the business a long time will remember those days when there were just a gazillion listing sites. They were all independent listing sites. And they were all vying for your marketing dollars. They were enticing you in with a free listing. And I said then, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking up these offers, but think twice before you sign up with too many. And also make sure you're able to link back to your own website before you do. And of course, things have changed drastically since then. So we're going to come back to that uh, a little bit later. I'm not going to read through all of these because some of them are really out of date. One is sending keys in the mail. That was a big mistake. I don't hear about anybody sending keys in the mail anymore. Or another point, which was asking for payment on arrival. At that point, I said, this is a big mistake. You don't ask for payment on arrival because you run the risk of people just not turning up or arriving with a check that then has to clear through your bank, which may not happen until they've departed. And of course, now we would not think of having any guest arrive that has not already made their payment. So 
I, I'm actually going to put a link to that old blog post. If you're interested in it, you can go take a look. But what I'd like to do in the short time I have today is to actually talk about big mistakes. But these are the big mistakes you can make as a vacation rental owner today. Part of me when I was thinking about recording this was, oh, I'll just take that 10 Biggest Mistakes blog post and talk through it. And I was really blown away when I read through them and thinking, yeah, these just aren't relevant anymore. We have moved forward so quickly and there's been so many changes in the industry that they just do not apply any longer. So let's go through, and I've just got five, five mistakes that I think you can make as a vacation rental owner. And I think some people make more than one of them from the very outset. Um, the first one is in direct competition to what I was just saying about listing on too many sites. And my first mistake, I think that vacation rental owners make is putting all their eggs in one basket. And I'm thinking that that those of you who list on Airbnb alone and nothing else are probably not listening to this podcast anyway. But I think it's worthwhile saying why I think you should not put all your eggs in one basket. And what I mean by that is not listing just on Airbnb or just on HomeAway or just on Booking.com. I'm not sure there's many people out there who are just listing on Booking.com and nothing else. But really, it's those big two. The listing sites have been changing dramatically over the past few years. And we don't know what's going to be around the corner. We do not know what's going to happen next. There is talk that Airbnb will start moving their guest service fees over to the owner. And it's suddenly going to be becoming much more expensive to put your property with Airbnb. Same with HomeAway. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. But if you just simply list with one site and ignore the rest, then you do put yourself in a difficult position if some disruption occurs and their algorithms change dramatically, your listing never gets seen anymore, and all of a sudden your bookings plummet. You can uh, look at any of the Facebook groups and you can see that people are commenting on some of these things. They're saying, you know, they've been with VRBO for years and now the bookings have just dried up or the inquiries have dried up. Certainly those with TripAdvisor have found inquiries have dried up. I just saw recently that some somebody had said exactly the same thing about their Airbnb inquiries. So you just can't risk this happening and not having anywhere else for your guests to find you. So of course, as we all we've been advocate, advocating for years, you need to have your own website. So at least you have your home base if something does happen. And of course, we're, we're striving to get our guests to book directly with us anyway. So you need to have that home base for them to come to. It was interesting that it wasn't that long ago I was saying one of the biggest mistakes you can make is to list on too many sites. And now really saying one of the biggest mistakes you can make is listing on only one. So, you know, it's somewhere in between getting there in between, but definitely having your own website. The second big mistake that I hope not many owners make, but I've certainly seen it, seen it in the questions that they're asking on the forums and on the groups, is not insuring well enough. And for those of you who listen to the podcast regularly, you'll know that as a, as a company, our company was cited in a lawsuit last year. So, of course, was the owner of the property that we were representing. And just briefly, the situation was a family arrived at a property. An elderly lady got out of the car. She decided not to use the pathway to access the front door. She walked across the grass. And in, in order to take that shortcut, she tripped over a curbstone and that lined the driveway. Now, this was a new property. It was all relatively new. So, so there, was, there was no negligence on behalf of the owner. This was a standard curbstone. And the lady made that decision to ignore the pathway and take the shortcut. 
She tripped over and she broke her knee. We didn't hear much about it until a couple of weeks later when the the guest uh, let us know that grandma had tripped and fallen. She'd broken her knee. She'd been in hospital and they were going to sue for damages. So fortunately, the owner of the property has good insurance. We have good insurance. And really, we've heard I mean, we've been, we're being sued for a million dollars. And would you believe elderly lady is suing us for, and she's 80, 85. So I, I think I can safely say she's fairly elderly. And they are suing for her loss of income, future income, and also her, the loss of her ability to do household, do-it-yourself tasks. So that apparently comes to a million dollars. Now, our broker says, yes, I know this is a frivolous claim. She's unlikely to get the million dollars, but it's very likely that the insurance company will pay out something because they they want the, it, it's just cheaper for them to get rid of, of the claim. But fortunately, because the owner is insured well enough, because we as a company are insured well enough, the insurance companies are working it all out between them. We just haven't really been uh, involved. However, it could be so different if the if the owner didn't have insurance or if we as a company didn't have insurance, then we would be de- dealing with it all ourselves. And despite any thought that this might be a frivolous claim, it's still hugely stressful and time consuming. It would be cost it would be costly because if you didn't have good enough insurance, you would have to hire a lawyer. Given the litigious nature of our society today, not having enough liability insurance is a massive mistake. And I cannot understand how some owners don't appreciate this. It's just too risky. So I've I've talked to insurers on a number of occasions on the podcast. Uh, I'll dig out the most recent one I did with Darren Pettijohn of Proper Insurance. And, and I really encourage you to go and listen to that. It was uh, it was a great conversation. And Darren talked about you know, not just liability insurance, but all sorts of um, other risks that can be covered by a good insurance policy. So that was that was my number two big mistake. Number three is being unprepared for emergencies. So emergencies come in all different shapes and sizes. And they can be as small as a dripping tap. A dripping tap might not seem to be an emergency for you, but for a guest who has paid a significant amount of money for a a vacation, a dripping tap can become the major issue of the vacation. So never underestimate how what might seem to you to be a minor irritant can impact a guest and you know if it's not if it's not dealt with pretty much immediately it then becomes a situation of refund and rebate and negative reviews emergencies can be anything from as i say a dripping tap to an appliance breaking down or an amenity not being available you know a fridge breaking down in the height of the summer the ac breaking down Any amenity or feature like that can be enough to curtail a vacation. And if you're not prepared for something like that happening, then it can be very costly. So what does being prepared for emergencies mean? Well, it it means having contingency plans in place. It means thinking about every little thing that could possibly go wrong and then creating a standard operating procedure to deal with it. This covers things like weather issues as well. As I'm recording this, we are having a massive snowstorm back in Ontario, which is the reason I'm down here in the south, avoiding this. And we have had a number of owners contact us and say their properties are not going to be available for guests coming in for the upcoming long weekend. We have a long weekend in February. We're having to deal with that fallout from from the weather. Well, fortunately, we have standard operating procedures in place that cover how we handle weather issues and 
cancellations of that nature. So I have done a podcast episode on this entire subject of being prepared for emergencies. And once again, I will put a link to that podcast on the show notes. You can go take a look at that and listen to it and uh, and download the information that we prepared for you to help you to create your emergency plans. But it is a major mistake if you go into this business and you don't consider every possible emergency that could happen and then put something in place to deal with it. Then you could find yourself in, you know, difficulties in terms of guests being unhappy, uh, additional costs and all round negative reviews. So the next big mistake is not being transparent enough about property flaws or drawbacks. Now, you may think, and you know, your property may be absolute perfection, but just about every place has got some form of drawback that might not make it as attractive to a guest if they didn't know about it. For example, let's have an example here, how close the neighbours are. Years ago, we had a photograph come through to us from a prospective owner of his cottage on Lake Huron. And it was a gorgeous, gorgeous little cottage, tiny little place right on the beach. And it it just looks so neat and easily accessible to the beach. And it gave an impression of privacy. My business partner went out to look at the property And the first thing he noticed, which you couldn't not notice it, was the mansions on either side of this tiny property. It was a stretch of beach where all the little old cabins had been knocked down and replaced with mega mansions, except this tiny little spot, which had been done up beautifully on the inside. It was just so unique, but it was sandwiched in beside these two enormous properties. And the owner was just not happy when we said, we have to take a photograph of this showing the neighbours. And he said, well, that's going to put them off. We said, well, no more so than them arriving and finding that what looked like the perfect private little getaway had huge properties either side, which were probably full of families and kids and dogs at the weekend. And their private looking little idyll was not as advertised. And he was not happy and actually decided that he wasn't going to list his property with us because we were going to be honest about it. We probably escaped the bullet there. We're very happy that uh, that, that he went elsewhere. When we take photographs of prop- of, of our registered properties, we always look to either side. We don't want anybody to have nasty surprises to arrive somewhere that's perhaps close to a road and not realise that there's going to be traffic going backwards and forwards. We have properties that are near railroads and we are completely transparent about how many trains there are per day, whether they come through at night and if there's whistles. It just doesn't help anybody if there are complaints about train noise on the first night of a guest stay. I mean, they they may still decide they don't like the train noise, but at least we have been completely upfront and transparent with what they should expect. Uh, something else is a- any access issues. I was reading some reviews of properties in the Gatlinburg area recently. And there were a couple of uh, lower rated reviews which said that the property that they'd been to was on a very steep road and nobody had told them how steep it was. They had found the access was not comfortable for them. So I went back to look at the listing and yes, there was there was no mention of the access at all. Whereas some of the other properties in the in the immediate area did talk about the steep hill that would have to be navigated before you got to the property. So it just is so important to look around. So even if it's something that's comfortable for you, always put yourself in the guest shoes. Are they going to be comfortable? Is it something that your persona, the target guest, is going to like when they arrive at the property? Just be transparent about it. 
let them know well in advance of anything that you feel may be a drawback. And it really doesn't matter if, if somebody then decides that they don't want to book your property because of that, because these are the people that would not have been happy if they'd arrived and found it anyway. So you're just doing yourself a favor by being very, very upfront. Something else to be transparent about is bugs and critters. We know this all too well in Ontario because we have a period of time in the early part of May, probably the first three weeks of May, where we deal with black fly. Now, black fly aren't mosquitoes. They aren't sand flies. They are a very specific, annoying, biting insect that can really make any time outside very, very unpleasant. And for many of our properties, we actually don't even open them up during that time. I mean, once the, once the heat starts, it, it sort of burns them off. But for those first few weeks of, of May, which is just after the ice has come off the lakes and it's quite damp and sometimes it can be a little bit humid, the black fly are horrendous. So we do talk about black fly. We also talk about mosquitoes because we have them from probably mid-May onwards. So after the black fly have gone, the mosquitoes come. It does make you wonder why anybody would want to come to cottage country in Ontario. But, you know, a gazillion people do. But we want them to be completely aware of, of what they're coming to and what to expect. We talk about mice. You may see signs of mice because mice are just an inherent part of cottage country. So whatever you have in your area in terms of bugs or critters or insects or things that go bump in the night, just make sure that your guests know about this before they book. And then they can't come back to you and say, you never told us. The last mistake I'm going to talk about is not being specific about your terms and conditions of rental. Now, I know that a lot of people don't have uh, rental agreements anymore. A lot of people don't have rental contracts, particularly on Airbnb, because you list your house rules on there. Your guests actually accept the house rules. But if you're not specific about those house rules, and you can call them house rules, you can call them terms and conditions of rental, whatever, they are the things that you want your guests to know they can or cannot do. If you're not specific enough, then you may easily run afoul of guests doing something you don't want them to do. You know, bringing more guests in if you don't have a maximum occupancy, for example. Letting off fireworks when fireworks are not permitted. That includes Chinese lanterns. You know, that would be something else uh, that we now include in our terms and conditions of rental, that we do not allow fireworks or Chinese lanterns to be uh, let loose in any of our properties. So just coming back on uh, what I've just mentioned about maximum occupancy, you may say, you know, your property sleeps and, uh, will accommodate a maximum of eight people. Now, if you limit that to so many adults and so many children, then you have to be specific about that. I mean, certainly in a number of our properties, we have bunk beds in properties and those top bunk beds cannot be used by anyone over £100. And that's a liability issue. There may be sleeping spaces for eight adults in a property, but eight adults cannot occupy every bed. So for, for that particular property, it would be a maximum of seven adults plus an additional child. So we have to be extremely specific about who can occupy and, and be accommodated in which place. You'd also be specific about whether you allow day guests or not, because many guests, overnight guests, don't consider that the people they invite to come and stay for the day are included in that maximum occupancy number. So you might say something like, our insurance restricts us to only six adults plus two additional children, and regretfully, we are not able to allow any day guests. We often play that insurance card. Uh, it's one that most guests understand and they will comply with. If you want to restrict your occupancy and keep the numbers to a reasonable level, then it's always okay 
to mention that you have insurance restrictions that will do that. You might also want to be specific about how your refunds and rebate policy applies. In case of power outages, perhaps, uh, you don't want a guest coming back to you after having had a 15-minute power outage to request a significant refund because of the, the impact it had on their vacation. So if it's in your terms and conditions, as, as we have, because many of our properties are quite remote and power outages happen fairly frequently. So we say that if, if a power outage does occur and it's outside the owner's control, we do not offer any refund or rebate for a power outage under four hours. We also mention uh, loss or breakdown of appliances and what would be considered a, an essential appliance or feature. So essential would be air conditioning. In the summer, it would be refrigeration. It is not the breakdown of a coffee maker that would warrant a refund. In those circumstances, we would try and get a replacement out to them as quickly as possible. But we wouldn't be doing a refund for the lack of a coffee maker for a few hours. It's amazing what people do ask for these days. If you're not specific about those terms and conditions, then really they have free reign to ask for what they want because it's not written in your terms and conditions uh, what they should expect. So that's my list of some of the biggest mistakes I think you can make as a vacation rental owner. Um, I have made numerous other mistakes over time and learned from every single one of them. And yeah, as I said earlier on about going to conferences, it's it's something that you always come across when you're talking to people. They will tell you what mistakes they made and what they put in place to recover from them. So that just adds to your learning process. And I know I'll learn more while I'm in New Orleans. So if there's any mistakes that you made that you'd like to share, please let me know. Please send me an email to heather at vacationrentalformula.com or put them onto the show notes. You can go to the show notes at Vacation Rental Formula forward slash VRS273 and let me know. You know, just, just write them in and I'll, I'm, I'm sure you'll get a good response from people who are going to say, yes, I made that mistake too. And here's how I resolved it. So this is, you know, it's all about sharing. We're not here in a vacuum. We are here to network, to be helpful to one another and to share those mistakes so that others don't make them. So that's it for this week. You know, if you get a chance, go and have a look at that uh, that blog post that I mentioned right at the beginning. Um, the, the 10 biggest mistakes you could make as a VRBO that I wrote way, way back. Um, do you know, I can't remember how long ago that was, but I'm sure it was sort of seven or eight years. But just about every one of those just about every one of those is no longer relevant. It just goes to show how this business moves, how it changes and how disruptive things can be. So so that's it for this week. I will be back with you again next week where I can tell you everything that happened at the Vacation Rental Women's Summit and talk to you about what I learned from all the great educational uh, sessions and from the sponsors and from the attendees and I'll share as much as I can. So until then, it's always a pleasure to be with you and I'll see you next week. This episode of Vacation Rental Success is over, but don't worry, Heather will be back soon. Want more great resources? Visit cottageblogger.com for tips, tricks, downloads, and strategies to help you achieve profit from your vacation rental business.